Good morning, everyone. That was lame. Try that again. Good morning, everyone. Much better. Thanks, Dave. Don't ever call me Dave again. Go ahead. No, it's all you. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, this is our, our Friday morning meeting. It's really your meeting. We try to make topics that you'll find interesting, informative. Certainly, if you have any questions, put your hand up. We love questions. We love uh, future topics on things we can talk about. We've got a lot today. We've got a lot of speakers. My name is Steve Field from the Safety Department. I've got Bill Sprague with me. Bill's been working with me in the Safety Department now for about eight years. Much better, much better. Sometimes I lose track of time and say he's only been here six months, but uh, Bill's been with us eight years. What I like about Bill is he's got a law enforcement background. Sometimes we're dealing with enforcement on an issue, trying to get information, trying to get the true story. And we always go to Bill on that. Uh, does a great job with uh, getting that information out of law enforcement. So I think before we get started and I let you know what our lineup is today, I think we'll go ahead and say hi to our terminals. For the folks that are new here, the way we run these meetings, we're doing it live from here, but we're also live out in Salt Lake City at our terminal and in Pittston, Pennsylvania in our terminal there. Unfortunately, we had a, an equipment malfunction that we're getting fixed in Pittston, so we won't be able to get any questions from them, but we will be able to see them and they'll be able to hear us and listen to the meeting. So let's start with Salt Lake City. Troy, are you out there? Good morning. Good morning, Troy. How are you, sir? Good morning. Good morning. How's it going out there? It's a beautiful day in Salt Lake City. Pretty good crowd there for you? We have a great crowd. We got a whole bunch of PSD and, and drivers, and we're all happy to be here in Salt Lake, right? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, everything we hear is that terminal just came out beautiful, and uh, I can't wait to get out there and see it. And uh, you got what you got your cafe you got your bunk rooms got your shop there what else is going on out there yeah they they've completely you know they rebuilt the building that we had here initially and they you know the shop of course they did that uh a couple of years ago and it's it's in fantastic shape and uh you know it's a beautiful place for to to come here i mean even you know the cafeteria now is later hours and so they take care of our drivers you know all through the day and through through the evening so uh we're you want to you need to come to take a break in salt lake we got some great bunk rooms and everything so it's a beautiful place now well good deal now we just got to grow into that building out there yes sir well good deal now we won't be able to talk to rick in pittston but i know he's up there so we'll say hi to pittston and uh welcome them to the meeting they don't have uh, any they don't have a mic up there today so we'll just say hi to them and and we'll move on before we get too far there is one thing i like to do at each of these meetings in the very beginning and i see a lot of folks around here with the orange vests on that tells me most of you are probably in our psd program you're just starting out they're yellow yellow i say orange yellow i've done yellow. that <laughs> Hey, he's colorblind. Don't be that way. <laughs> Yellow vest. But regardless, if you're brand new to Prime, whether you're coming in into our PSD program or you've got some experience, would you go ahead and stand for a minute? We'd just like to see you and welcome you to the Prime family this morning. <laughs> You know, that is great. Thank you. Go ahead. Sit down. Uh, you, you put a lot of trust in us. You've, you, you've left home. It's a new career for you. You're probably a little bit apprehensive. You, you know, they see the men and women around here that kind of seem they know like they know what's going on. The trucks are moving around. Everyone's going 100 miles an hour. And you're just thinking, you know, what have I got myself into? Can I really do this? And, and the answer is, yes, you can. It's going to be very challenging. We're going to give you the best possible training training in the industry. We've been doing this now for 15 years, our PSD program. We've grown it, We've it's matured, we've improved on it each year, but it is gonna be difficult. It is going to be challenging. You've got a great instructor you'll be paired with, and then you'll get your trainer who may be the same person or may be different. My recommendation to you is listen to these folks, these men and women that are instructing and training. They've done it themselves. We've put them through additional training. They know what they're doing, but that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. You can't push back if something doesn't seem right.
right. You've got a lot of folks around here that are that are uh, really encouraging you to, to be successful and to make it. So there'll be times when you think, I just don't know if I can do this, but you can do it. So hang in there and, you know, we hope to see you back you know, many times in our safety meetings and then maybe in a, a year or so giving back to the industry, being a trainer or an instructor yourself and maybe in seven or eight years, seeing you up on stage at our Million Mile Banquet, getting an award, uh, maybe being an ATA uh, member of the road team, representing the entire industry. Uh, so there's just incredible opportunity. You've come at a great time. We do welcome you and uh, thanks for being in our meeting today. And something I want to say to the PSD students, when you see these wonderful facilities like we have here, like we have in Salt Lake, and like we have in Piston, you need to remember those were built by drivers just like yourself. We don't build those without drivers going out there and running safely, hauling freight every single day. Your blood, sweat, and tears is what built this place, so thank you for joining us. We're very grateful to have you here. Uh, we checked you out closely. I hope you've checked us out. Again, if you have questions, if you have concerns, grab someone around the building. You're never on your own. Uh, I see Stan Kastriki over there. You probably most of you have met Stan. Stan is truly accessible. He wants to know if something's not right so we can make it right. You'll hear us say time and time again, we're not perfect. We're pretty good, but we're not perfect. And if something's not right, we need to know about it so we can make it right. So again, and welcome. I want to start with safety today, and I'm going to ask Bill to do most of this. Uh, when you're out on the road, obviously our veterans know this, you're subject to roadside inspections. They look at a lot of stuff out there, check your logbook, make sure your license is valid, inspect your equipment, look at your electronic logs. And we get inspected about 120, 140 times a week, probably is our average. We do really well out there, but there's always room for improvement. So I'm going to ask Bill to kind of go into what happens on those roadside inspections, how that impacts crime, and how it impacts you individually. So go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Steve. This week alone, we had 62% of our inspections were clean. So when we talk about inspections, we had a Missouri State Highway Patrolman up here just a few years ago, and he said the average across the industry is about 40%. On, a, on any given day, 40% for clean inspections. So that tells you how good Prime does on inspections. But it's good because the information I'm about to share with you, you need to realize we do this because we gotta keep that CSA score as good as it can possibly get. And I'm gonna kind of give you how I learned what CSA score is. I'm not gonna go into the formulas and charts and graphs and everything they use that makes up our CSA score. I'm gonna tell you what it is in layman's terms because that's how I best understand it. CSA points is really what our report card as a company is made of. So when a carrier is trying to determine who they're gonna give their freight to, they're gonna log into the CSA portal and they're gonna compare our safety score versus the other carrier that we're competing with. Now, if they've got a better safety score than us, they're gonna get the freight that was probably meant for us. So we have gotta keep these inspections clean. So anytime you roll through an inspection, whether it be on the side of the road or if you go into a fixed way station, any violation written on that inspection is gonna carry CSA points. Those CSA points go against that score. So some of the basics I'm gonna talk with you about are the three basics that we really need to work on because they're the ones that we're having the highest safety score in right now. And we've gotta bring that number down. It's like golf and safety, or when it comes to CSA score, the lower the points, the better. We want zero, okay? The number one violation under unsafe driving. Now, when I say unsafe driving, when you get one of these violations, that's the basic it falls under. In other words, it doesn't give an explanation of what you got it for. It doesn't give an explanation of what was going on at that scale that day that made it confusing the reason you didn't pull in. All it says is unsafe driving and you got this many points. So the biggest violation we get, failing to obey a traffic control device. And when you get a, a, an inspection violation for a traffic control device, you gotta realize that can be anything from parking on the side of the road when there was a sign posted for no parking to bypassing a scale. They all fall under that same umbrella. But now think about something, You have, if they issue you a ticket for a traffic control device at the same time, that's a moving violation when you have a CDL. So even if, if you're sitting on the side of the road sleeping in front of a no parking sign, you're gonna get a violation that's a moving violation on your CDL and you gotta protect that. But those CSA points that we get for that traffic control device are right now the second as far as 
that we've got two times as many points for that violation as any other violation across the board. We have got to do better trip planning and know where these scales are because that is really driving our unsafe basic too high. Look in your atlas. You know what those red dots are on each state? You see them on, on different atlas pages. That's a fixed scale. Know what's there. When you're doing your, your break, 30 minute break, let's stop somewhere just prior to that scale so you can look your equipment over. That way, not only do you know the scale's coming up, you can be in the correct lane, you can be prepared to stop. On top of that, always err on the side of caution. If those signs are confusing, and we know they can be, maybe you're getting an in-cab signal that's different from what you're seeing out there on that sign on the side of the road, pull in. Worst they're gonna do is wave you through, but they're not gonna come chase you down if they thought it was gonna be the other way. Okay, the second violation that we get that carries the most points, seatbelt. Folks, we should never be getting a seatbelt violation. Those seatbelts were made to keep you safe. And I know they're uncomfortable. If you don't like the way they rub you, get some of these padded cushions. You've seen them that slide over it because you're wearing that thing 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Get one of those and put on it because you have to wear that and you got to wear it correctly. Don't have it loose. They can write you the same as they can for not having it on. Don't have it tucked behind your back and just the lap belt on. That's not correct. But you have to remember these trucks were built to keep you safe. But the only way that they're going to keep you safe is if you use that safety equipment. I'm going to tell you, Steve and I have looked at some pictures of some pretty horrific accidents. And our driver was the one taking the pictures. I mean, we've seen cabs sheared completely off the frame. Our driver's the one taking the pictures because he had his seatbelt on. These trucks will keep you safe, but you got to use it, okay? The third one is speed, 6 to 10 over. That's a no-brainer. Pay attention to all signs. Don't wait until you get to that speed zone to slow down. Make sure you're at that speed before you hit that sign. Second basic is hazardous materials. Now, hazardous materials, it doesn't take very many violations at all to drive us into an unsafe category when it comes to that basic, okay? The things that we've got to work on, package not secured in vehicle. We know a lot of these trailers are sealed, right? When you get to the customer, the customer don't let you look. We want you to ask. At least ask the customer, can I look and make sure load locks and everything are in place? If the customer says, no, it's sealed, we're not going to open it, put that on your Qualcomm. And the reason we say that is if you get down the road and you get dinged on an inspection, that's not gonna come back on you. We need to try and challenge that inspection to say our driver, here's his QC note, he checked, they wouldn't let him open it up. So it's not our fault that they, the load locks were misplaced. And a lot of times we can challenge those and have them removed from the inspection, but we don't know if you don't ask, okay? Um, the other ones are placard issues. You gotta make sure, always ask the customer for an extra placard. You never know when you might lose one, one might blow out. And this is gonna be hard to believe, People steal them when you're parked overnight. If you're in a truck stop, somebody could come up, oh, I'm, I'm missing one of those placards. Not everybody's as honest as you'd like them to be, right? And they can take them. Another thing to keep in the truck, anytime you're gonna be hauling this, is get you some of that clear tape. Tape around the outside edge of that to keep it in place. Those can get to vibrating. The wind can whip them out of there. Make sure that you put clear tape around it. That'll keep those in place. And that way you don't have any issues with how it doesn't take much at all to drive our hazardous materials violation score too high. So the third basic is logs. I'm going to let you cover that, Steve, because I know you came from the log department. So what can you share with them on it? You know, we went to electronic logs back in 2009. So I guess we've been on them now about 12 years. I, our drivers do great with it. They certainly present some challenges. You have to trip plan better. You've got to know your rules because there's no starting over, you know, grabbing another log book and redoing it like the old timers will tell you was done out there. Uh, but there are a couple of things we can improve on and it's not going over hours as much as it is kind of crossing the T's and dotting the I's, making sure you have that spare log book, making sure you know where your visor card is, that you have to show the officer that this is how these logs operate, making sure you know how to transmit the logs to the officer. Those are some of our biggest violations we get. What we have every week, I'm sorry, every day is a comprehensive log class down in the new Plaza building, Monday through Friday. We have it, I think it's at 1.30 down there. We have it every week down there. If you have questions about logs, that's a great time to go, kind of refresh your memory on how to transmit those logs to the officer. Because it's a little bit nerve wracking when you're at a scale, he's looking at you 
media. Maybe he's got a gun and he's saying, I need to see those logs, driver. And uh, it doesn't help to have a little refresher training. So I will ask you to make sure you're always in contact with your log advisor. If you have an inspection, if you have a violation, and they can help you with it. And we'll make it, uh, make it a little bit easier for you the next time. You know, that's a good question. The question was, can we do it online? We've got a lot of videos out there. What we are working on is getting that class kind of going to Pittston and going to Salt Lake City, but maybe we can add to that where anyone could log in. Let me make a mental note of that and uh, talk to our IT folks over here. And uh, that's a good point. We'll take a look at it. You know, at the end of the day, CSA is our scorecard. We have to live with it. It's not perfect. But I'll tell you about one basic that Bill didn't talk about because we do great in it. And it's really the one that matters the most. And it's our crash basic. As Bill said, lower the score, the better. Worst, zero is best. I think right now we're at a 38 on our crash basic. So what that means is out of every 100 carriers, we're the 38th best. That sounds bad on the surface, but when you look at our exposure out there, the size of our fleet, 38 is extremely impressive for a carrier uh, such as Prime. I think a lot of our competitors would really like to have that crash basic. So there's areas we can improve on. Bill talked about them. Let's work at this together. Let's try to drive that clean inspection rate up to 75%, up to 80%. We do pay $100 if you're a lease operator and you get a clean inspection. If you're a company driver or a second seat, you get $25. We recognize your time out there. And if you have a clean inspection, that's kind of our way of saying thanks. So go ahead. And one more note on that. It's since, you know, this is your report card too. I want to explain to you that CSA points don't stay on you forever. If you get an inspection tomorrow, that doesn't mean in 10 years from now, those CSA points are still on you. They're called time weighted. So if you get a, an inspection violation tomorrow, let's say it's worth five points, it's times three. So it's 15. In six months, it's going to go back down to times two. So you're going to have 10 points. At the end of a year, it goes back to the original five points. Two years after that, you're back to zero. So your numbers do improve as long as you don't get any more violations to replace it. Any questions on how CSA works or the points or anything? Pretty straightforward, but we hadn't talked about it in a while. Seems like a good topic for today. Before we start getting to our speakers, and I'll give you an idea who we're going to have for speakers today. We've got Sam Messick, who's going to talk about fuel. And if you're a lease operator, that is your number one variable cost out there, fuel. And there's a lot of money to be made or lost, depending upon the way you purchase fuel. So we're going to have Sam up here. We always get a lot of questions uh, on fuel. We've got Chris Martin, who's taking over the role of placing our TNTs with our trainers out there. It's a good opportunity for you to meet him, see who Chris is. Uh, we've got Tyler Patrick from Road Assist. He's got a couple topics to cover. And we haven't had operations up in a while. So we'll have uh, reefer operations, uh, flatbed, and intermodal. Tanker is a little shorthanded today, so we won't have tanker, but we'll catch up on them next time. But I do want to talk just about a couple of things before we bring Sam up. And you know, I get a lot of calls or we get stuff over uh, social media. Can you talk about this at the safety meeting? Can you talk about that? And I just got a couple of real quick notes here that on a couple of things I, I do want to mention just to make sure you're aware of it. And I should have mentioned this at the beginning. We kind of changed our meetings during COVID. So the meeting now is going out over Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So if you're not able to make the meeting, you can see it uh, while you're out there, assuming you're not driving, you can watch it later. We do try to make it so you want to every week catch the meeting and learn something, hopefully, from us up here. So a couple of my points that I have this week, uh, you may not know this but in Pennsylvania they're starting to have what I'll just call them camera tickets for speeding in construction zones there's no car out there I see a see a not I hope you didn't get one hopefully you just heard about them uh, they are out there just because there's not enforcement present doesn't mean that Pennsylvania is not enforcing the speed limits and those tickets come into us and we take care of them the driver is responsible for those so just kind of a word to the wise as always, obey all speed limits, but in Pennsylvania, they are using the cameras to uh, monitor speed in the zones. Mayfair Avenue, for our you know folks that have been around a while for probably 45 years or so, you, you got to prime by coming down Mayfair Avenue. We don't do that anymore. People forget sometimes and they start down Mayfair. If you do, just go to the bottom of the hill, 
call security. If I'm out walking, I've been deputized. I'm allowed to open that gate and I'll get you make a U-turn there and we'll send you back up the hill. We're not mad at you. It's easy to do. It's uh, it happens to us every day. What we don't want you to do is start backing up. It looks like, well, I can back up, slide in there. And the next thing you know, you're sitting in the ditch and we've got to get a wrecker. Let's just not make a, it's not even a bad situation. Let's not make a situation that we can easily correct by opening up the gate having you make a U-turn and go back up the hill by trying to back up. So please, let's not back up on Mayfair. One thing on parking, Bill talked about kind of planning ahead on where you're parking. I think parking is probably one of the biggest challenges you face out there from the lack of parking, particularly probably east of the Mississippi. It gets worse until you, until you get to the east coast. But we do need to be careful where we're parking. And by that, I mean, we're not, we're not parking on the shoulder we really don't want to be parking on ramps. I know every situation is different, uh, but at the end of the day, we would prefer your parking in a, in a legal spot with lighting that's safe for you. That's not always possible. So I'll just ask that you go ahead and think, where am I going to try to park? Is this a safe place to park? And uh, we'll work through any issues out there. I think those were the only comments that I got last week or questions. Anything for Bill and I before we relinquish the mics to some of our speakers up here? Guys are pretty quiet today, but that's all right. We'll keep moving. And uh, if you have questions for anyone, just shoot your hands up. Andrea gets them online. Oh, that, I'm sorry. That, forgot one other thing. You know, got it right here. You know, these smartphones are fantastic. It's amazing what you can do. And we see a lot of good submissions, whether it's pictures or videos of things you see out there. But I've got to tell you, we don't want you using that phone, taking pictures and videos while you're driving. We see them all the time. Andrea and Mitch over here, they're constantly monitoring social media. And sometimes people are jealous or, you know, they just, I don't know. And they'll send comments in, look at this dumb me here driving down the road taking a picture and we're just going to ask it's not it's not the right thing to do it's not our expectation if you're in the passenger seat it's fine if you're stopped it's fine but please not while you're driving and then uh, one step further putting it on social media social media is is everywhere out there it can be a great great tool for us it allows us to communicate but it can also be used against us and harm us so just be careful with your posts on social media Last chance on questions. Okay, Sam. I'm gonna ask Sam Messick to come up. Sam works in our accounting department, does a lot of things. Uh, kind of surprised how much he actually does over there, but one of the things he does is fuel. And uh, so I think it's Sam to kind of come up, talk about our fuel network and take any questions that you have. So go ahead, Sam. Thank you very much, Steve. I don't know how much I do. I'm responsible for a lot, but I don't know if I actually do anything. But um, just wanted to give everybody a couple of reminders, a couple of updates, as I'm sure you've seen over the last couple of days. We've had the remainder of all of our fuel deals uh, for 2021 go into play. Um, so you've probably seen a lot of pricing changes, a lot of changes in which stops are getting recommended across the network on your dispatches and stuff. So I just took a quick look this morning and on average, uh, Pilot Flying J is about six to seven cents cheaper across the country within our network than Loves. And it's about four to five cents cheaper than TA Petro across our entire network. So you're probably going to see that you're getting recommended a lot of Pilot Flying J locations over the next year. Um, hopefully that hopefully the pricing that they're offering, uh, it, you know, you see it as being really good and very beneficial to your operations. It is very competitive pricing. They've given us a really good DEF discount. They've given us really good fuel pricing. Um, one thing that they agreed to give us yesterday as kind of an extension of what we had for June is free shower power for the month of uh, July. So for those of you that don't use shower power, it basically gives you free showers at any Pilot Flying J locations uh, every day. Um, so usually you have to get 500 gallons as a prime driver. Usually if you're just an everyday truck driver, you have to get a thousand gallons at any Pilot Flying J, lo or at Pilot Flying J locations across the country every month to get shower power. If you're a prime driver, you only have to get 500 gallons to get shower power at Pilot Flying J locations. Well, for the month of June, Pilot just gave it to us after your first purchase, regardless of how many gallons you purchased. 
for July, they're doing the exact same thing, just as a, a, an appreciation for our business, really for your business, and for uh, they want to kind of kick things off the right way with you all uh, as customers. So after your first fueling in the month of July, just like back in June, you will have shower power automatically at Pilot Flying J locations. It might not show up in your app uh, because it's a promo specifically for Prime. They don't have a custom program that can go in there and update it just for prime drivers to show that you have it but after your first fueling in july you'll have it at pilot flying j locations the other thing that i wanted to mention is there's some confusion as far as on the 500 gallon threshold once you hit 500 gallons purchased at pilot flying j locations you'll have shower power for the rest of that month and for the following month so you don't have to technically re-earn it each month in terms of you, you don't have to pay for showers until you hit the 500 gallon threshold, right? So if, if you buy 500 gallons in July, you'll have free shower power th through the end of July and for the month of August. So it, just keep in mind that it, there should be no gaps in terms of y your coverage and getting free showers. Also remember Loves has extended a uh, platinum status all prime drivers, that's free showers free drinks even though they don't have great pricing with us we really appreciate them doing that it means that really across the country anywhere you are you should have access to to a free uh hopefully clean shower um so we appreciate them doing that really make sure you're watching uh i know a lot of folks like loves and we really we do too we love those guys we think they do a great job of servicing uh, the business, but make sure that you're keeping an eye on in states like California, Texas, Illinois, especially if you're a loves only person, I encourage you in those states, take a look at Pilot Flying J. You're way overpaying for fuel if you're fueling with loves in any of those three states specifically. But as I mentioned across the board, Pilot's definitely the, the cheapest vendor to be utilizing. Um, I've talked about shower power. One of the things that I wanted to mention too is keep an eye out because, you know, a lot of the time I know a lot of the recommendations that the fuel and route optimizer, fuel optimizer gives, they're the same if you're hauling the same lane, you know, generally you might see the same stops recommended over and over again for you know, it, for the last year, Loves has been the main fuel provider within our network. Well, obviously that's changed. So keep an eye on those fuel optimizations really closely over the coming months, because you're going to see that we're recommending a lot different locations than we were recommending within the last year, just because now Pilot's significantly cheaper than Loves and TA Petro. So make sure you're taking, I always encourage you to take a look at those fuel recommendations and follow them but make sure definitely over the coming weeks and months that you're really taking a look at them because you're going to see a lot more new locations that maybe weren't getting recommended before. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to make note of is I've got a lot of comments from operators over the last, I'll call it year or so, about having issues getting the reefer, uh, the fuel nozzle into the reefer tanks. So I actually reached out to Paul Higgins on this. He does all of our trailer purchasing and he said that they are working on, I think they've worked with a couple different vendors and they have a solution that they think is going to, to fix the issue uh, going forward. So I think on all of our tra trailer purchases from now forward, uh, that the modification that they're making should be in place. So hopefully that will, obviously it's going to take some time for that issue to go away because you know it takes time to cycle trailers out of the fleet. But uh, uh, Paul, I think had gotten quite a bit of feedback on that issue too. And, you know, we obviously want to get that for you and, and fix it. So it sounds like Paul has fixed it. Um, and I won't, I, I don't know if he's here, but I won't, I'll, I will spare you bringing him up here because we don't want to be here till 10 o'clock today, but I, he's, he's got it fixed. That's all I'll say. So no, we appreciate what Paul does. He's a good guy. <laughs> Any questions for me? That's really all I had as far as updates. What about the uh, one nine locations that used to be pilots? We used to be able to fuel there. Now we can't fuel there anymore. So we probably have about 10 to 15 one nine locations that are in network that we still have really good discounts with. Um, if you have specific locations that you feel like would be key to our business, very beneficial to our business, let me know and we'll get with Pilot Flying J and see if they can make an exception to give us a really aggressive discount there. They just don't 
discount them very aggressively. They're meant to be retail minus locations, and obviously we don't want to be buying for retail minus discounts, but they will make exceptions for us. Retail minus, so all of our discounts are what we call cost plus, so the vendor has a cost, and then they mark it up a little bit past that cost, so we, it's a much larger discount. Retail minus is just cents off the posted price. There's a question. Any other question? Oh, question around the corner. Hey. Hey, it's your friend Jada. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Quick question, have we addressed with Pilot Flying J the cleanliness of their showers and what are they doing for the drivers that shower over there? Because it's almost like a side of mold with your shower. Yeah, so 100% we have. And I always encourage folks, you know, on the Prime Mobile app, there's a place where you can go in and review locations. If you're in a location that's just nasty, make sure you go in there and give us a review on that location. Uh, it's really important for us as we give them feedback, they look at those star ratings that are put into the mobile app and they kind of react based off of that. But yes, we 100% have given them feedback. I will say the most valuable feedback are pictures and examples of specific locations that have an issue, right? Because they hear a lot of generic complaints, but if we can give them very pointed feedback on locations with pictures of what was wrong, they, they're basically forced to follow up with a specific general manager and get the issue at least addressed and hopefully resolved going forward. What, does, do we have a mic still? Yeah. Do we send those pictures in via the pilot app or do we send them to you? Just send, send them to us. I mean, eventually once we feel like we've got it to the point that the majority of the issues are resolved, we might say just pass it through the pilot app. But we want to see those because if it's a major issue, we want to make sure we're pushing hard to get it addressed. So, yeah, send those to us if you don't mind. Um, I, it, I can give you my email address. I think you probably already have it, but shoot them to me and we'll uh, we'll get them over to pilot. I know, you know, they are doing a ton of hiring right now. They're really struggling just to get people at their locations. Uh, but that's no excuse not to have clean showers. That should be a priority. So yeah, send us examples. Right. Hey, Sam, we have some questions online. Steve said pilot app doesn't work with Kong data for mobile app. They need to fix it. Do you know if they're doing anything about that? It does work with the mobile app. So it, uh, whoever had that comment, I'll, we can reach out to you directly and get that issue resolved. Okay. We have another one that said, how are fuel prices at prime terminals compared to truck stops? So we beat the closest. So like in Springfield, Missouri, we're always benchmarking against Joplin, Missouri. So we beat the Joplin price by a penny or two every day, which Joplin, we have a fantastic discount there. In Utah, we're beating the closest, most competitively priced location, which is Ogden, Utah, by the same, a penny or two every day. And then in, in uh, PA, we're beating Bloomsburg, which is the cheapest, closest, uh, or reasonably close location by a couple pennies every day. The goal is to beat it by a couple pennies every day. And then on the DEF side, we're usually 20, 30, 40 cents cheaper uh, than the discounted price across over the road. Question about the TA Petro um, rewards program. Are they still doing the platinum or are they discontinuing that? So it, I, the platinum benefits, no, as far as there are certain benefits, right, that you do get if you're platinum. We're, we are third gear, which does not include platinum. Uh, I've ha I have had a conversation with, with them about it. I'm not sure that it's going to stay that way, that we don't have platinum. They might give it back to us. We're working on it. One thing, too, to keep in mind about, I, I, I may have been in a message that I sent out the other day. I said that the ultra credits that you earn at TA Petro, if you get 60 gallons, you get an ultra credit that's good for a shower, a free meal, or a parking spot, that it's only good for 10 days. It's actually good for 14 days, just as a clarification on that. Wait. We have another question. Can you clarify Love Showers and how long they're offering? So Love's is offering that indefinitely to prime operators, uh, the platinum status, which is three times points, free showers, free drink refills at all their locations. Um, one more is I stopped at a Pilot Express and it was out of network. Is the Pilot Express a different company than the normal Pilot? No, they're the same. It's just they're trying to make them... They're trying to brand them differently so that they can offer less of a discount at the locations, basically. The Pilot Express locations are very key locations as far as they're in densely populated areas or something where they spend a lot of money to buy the land and stuff to build the location. So they're just not offering good discounts there. So generally, that's why we wouldn't have them open in the network. 
one other thing that I'll mention is, you know, whenever we're fueling at locations that like if you're fueling at one nine network locations that don't offer good discounts, or if you're fueling at Love's locations that aren't giving us as good of discounts as Love's or as pilot locations are, it really hampers our ability to go out in the future and get the best deals for you all as operators, right? We it so much if we can reward the vendors that are giving us the right if we can go to the locations that are giving us the right discounts it really helps you know push the point that you aren't getting prime's business unless you give us the absolute best pricing available right if we're giving them business even though they're they're not where they need to be pricing wise it really hurts us long term so please help us reward these partners like pilot flying j that have stepped up on pricing it really helps uh last question is from angel i would like to know how the fuel discount works i don't understand it yeah, I can, we'll give you a tutorial on it, Angel. I'll reach out to you and uh, you can come do my job. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Super. Steve. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you coming up this morning. Thanks for all the questions. And Sam's always accessible. He's in the same building. I'm in the Z building, the main floor. He's always there. If you have any questions, feel free to, to stop in and see him. There were a couple things that came in on some other topics I want to cover real quick. I, I missed one last week uh, about the picnic and uh, the truck driving what's going on this year. What I'll say about that is we're cautiously optimistic that we're going to be able to do something this you know, the Delta variant has kind of thrown us for a, you know, might be a little bit of a setback, but we truly, truly want to have our truck driving championship. We want to have our picnic. We may need to make some accommodations for it. But as it stands now, we're going to try our best to move forward with that. Uh, it'll be over Labor Day weekend. That can change. We just have to see what's going on with the with the COVID situation. Uh, Pam Linhart works for me, and she gets a lot of the calls that we get from other uh, motorists, whether they're complaining or complimenting us. She said, Steve, can you remind our folks when you're taking your 30 minute break, please don't take it after you pull forward on the fuel island. Uh, and, and, you know, you've probably seen people out there doing it, taking their 30 minute break. And now that next truck can't pull forward. You know, we live by a, a really three simple rules, if you will, here at Prime. Do your best, do what's right and treat other people the way you want to be treated. So I don't think we need to see any more about that. That's not the the right place to take your break. A couple other questions that came in here real quick. Uh, forgot them already. Can you address uh, taking photos of accidents? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you've probably all heard of twisted trucker and stuff like that. It, it, it's just wrong. It, it, it's inappropriate. You know, someone's involved in an accident. They they weren't there intentionally. It's probably impacting their family, the the families of other people involved in the accident. There's just really no need to to be posting pictures, basically making fun of other people that you know had some bad luck that day or something. So I'm just going to ask that that we don't do that. We're above that, and, and there's not a need to to get out there and say you know if it's a you know a swift truck or oh, look at that dummy, look what he did. No, we're better than that. And wasn't there one more, Andrea? Yes, Denise asked, if you had hours left but ran into high traffic, how can we avoid not getting a violation? You know, high traffic is always a challenge. The FMCSA has been a little bit more generous on the adverse driving conditions. It used to be only for weather. They do say now, if you run into unexpected traffic, whether it's due to an accident or something happened, if you go over on your hours, if you put an annotation right there, you'll probably be okay at a roadside inspection. That's not talking about rush hour traffic around Atlanta that's to be expected but if but if it's unexpected go ahead don't falsify your logs go over on it and put an annotation right there and you'll probably be okay with that okay Chris Martin uh, I'm gonna ask Chris to come up there he is he was hiding on me dispatched here for 18 19 years and then uh, kind of we volunteered. It was a last man standing. But regardless, I'll call him our TNT coordinator. Got a huge process of coordinating our TNTs, our folks that have gotten through the PSD program, getting them with their trainer, getting them matched up, making sure it's going to work and making sure it's going to be successful. So go ahead, Chris. All right. Thanks, Steve. I think you pretty much set it all for me there. So I'm going to. You're done. No, I'm, done. I'm not done. So Chris and I'm in our uh, training department, driver development um i started about two months ago and like steve said i had my own fleet for 18 years um and a big part of that was our my uh 
training within my fleet. Okay, so that's where all of my new drivers came from. Was, they were people that my trainers had trained. And, you know, any success that I had in that fleet, I felt like I owed it to the fact that uh, the guys that I got, the gals that I got in my new trucks, they were by prime people. Okay, so they only ever knew the prime way. Um, but, you know, in the training department now, so we're looking to make this program better all the time. And a big part of that is that we always need more good trainers. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, why would you want to train who can train? And then a couple of misconceptions about training. Okay. So I'll start with, why would you want to train? Okay. I'll give you a few reasons. There's more than a few. Here's a, a few good ones. First, to make Prime better. Okay. So the quickest way that you can, outside of your own operation, impact the, uh, the safety record, the customer service of Prime is through helping train people to do things the right way. Right. Um, that's good for you. That's good for the customer. That's good for everybody at Prime. Number two is income, more money. Um, that shouldn't be the only reason to train, but it's a big one. Um, for example, last week, uh, and I just looked at the lease fleet, the average income, the average paycheck for the lead seat on a team truck was $1,800 more than the average paycheck for a solo driver okay so it's basically a second income and they are, are lead seats on a team truck actually more than doubled the paycheck of a solo driver okay so making more money is a good thing and then the third reason and i think this is an, a, another big one i think this is what really keeps people coming back when they train is the opportunity to teach someone a skill so they can provide an income for their own family. So it's teaching, helping someone else come up with that income, okay? Um, if you've ever gotten to go to one of our instructor of the year or trainer of the year dinners, uh, you know, and you, you hear some of those guys get up there and talk about why they train, and there's a lot of emotion in those speeches because it's pretty powerful stuff, again, to give someone that gift where they can provide for their family. Here's somebody that, doesn't have an income right now. Um, they may not have a house, um, and you give them a skill that helps them, you know, they have the opportunity now to make an income. So that's the why, uh, who can train? So first thing, nine months with a CDL, okay? If you've had a CDL for nine months, why, anybody know why we say nine months? There we go. <laughs> and that's the other one. Make sure you're not pregnant. <laughs> winter driving. Okay. So we think nine months. At some point in that nine months, you're going to get some exposure to winter driving. Okay. Because we don't want you to be out there in the snow for the first time with a trainee and saying, hey, we're going to figure this out together. We want you to have a little bit of experience at some point in your own driving. Uh, in winter. Second, 60 days is a lead seat. Okay. Next, we want to have had ACE2 class. So we had to have had ACE2 class if you're a leaser, and then the PSC class or safety class. Okay. Um, then we've got to talk to the fleet manager. So we talk to the fleet manager and tell them we want to train, and your fleet manager is going to be looking at your safety record, your logs history, your service record. And how profitable are you? Okay, so our safety department, our logs department, your fleet manager, the training department, we're going to check off, you know, check all the boxes and make sure that you're qualified to train. But, you know, if, if we, if you have that conversation with your fleet manager and there's something that you need to work on, we can work on that. Um, I've had more than a few guys that wanted to train and we had to get better in some of those areas to train. So in that way, I think training made the trainer, the future trainer better. But um, I, and next one, you know, we talk about what kind of person should train, um, different character attributes, um, personality qualities. I would just say this, 
if you can treat others the way you want to be treated, that's the big one. That's that kind of sums it up. So if I'm talking to a trainee or a trainer on a truck and there's been a little bit of conflict, um, typically what happens is somebody's not treating somebody else the way they want to be treated. Okay. And then the last one, just do you have a a heart and a passion to teach? Okay. That's a big one. And then the last thing I'll go over, so that's kind of the who can train, is just a couple of misconceptions about um, about training. And the first one is that if you take the TNT, the training classes, then now you got to train all the time, okay? So you're going to be stuck with somebody in your truck for your career prime, and, and that's not true, okay? So training is different things for different people in terms of how often they do it. So I've, I had some trainers that would train year-round. I had some that would train maybe one or two trainees a year. I had a lot of guys that would train someone and then take a month off. So uh, how often you train is flexible. That's up to you. Any participation that you give in the program will help. And then the second one would be that I have to have driven for years at Prime to be a good trainer. Okay. So again, that's just not true. Uh, a lot of my best trainers were folks that had gone through our training program sometime within the last year okay and those folks uh, that were recently trainees themselves um, you know they are really good at relating with the trainee and what they're going through all the new things that they're learning the new lifestyle um, and they're also very in tune with the expectations that we have in the training program so if you're somebody that hasn't been driving for years and you're letting that stop you from being a trainer, I would uh, encourage you to, to think again. Um, if, if you've been through the program recently, then I think you're somebody that would have a lot to offer. Um, Steve Tasson, where'd you go? I don't know where he's at. Oh, he's getting breakfast. Okay. I thought he had a few things he wanted to say, but um, again, my name's Chris Martin. If you have any interest in training, um, get a hold of me. Get a hold of your fleet manager. Talk to them about it. Ask them to give you my number. I'd love to talk to you. Um, you know, right now in particular, um, and, and this is pretty common, the toughest folks for me to get out on the road are female trainees. So I'm going to call on our Highway Diamonds that aren't already training, we need you. Okay, we got a lot of great female drivers out there, and I think we've got probably quite a few that do a great job but aren't training yet, and we'd love to have you. So I'll open it up to any questions. Any questions for Chris? A lot of information there. I will tell you this, if there's one thing that has gotten primed to where we are today, if we can only pick one, it's probably our, our PSD program and taking folks without experience, getting them their license, and then through the TNT program. It's been a, it, it's just really been what has taken us to the next level as far as our, our size, our capacity to, to, uh, to service our shippers, and it really has changed this company. No. All right, you got off easy, Chris. Yeah, say real quick. My, sure. my buddy, one of my old time drivers, Tom Withers, you know him? I know Tom. All right, so he called me last uh, a couple weeks ago and said, I saw you in the meeting, man. He said, You did pretty good, Mo. So I just want to give a call out real quick to Tom and say hi, Tom, and, and uh, be safe out there, buddy. Good deal. Thanks, Chris. Tyler, you ready? We're running a little short on time, but we still, we're going to get everybody in. I'm going to bring up Tyler Patrick. Tyler's in our road assist department, gets involved in our uh, training of, of drivers with information, just a real wealth of knowledge. So go ahead, Tyler. Thanks, Steve. Hey, guys, my name is Tyler Patrick. Like Steve just said, I'm from the road assist department. And uh, real quick, I don't want to take up too much time here. I know Steve said we're running a little bit slow here, but one of the things I want to talk about is our pro maintenance program. So we've talked about logs class. We've talked about TNTs and ACE2 and stuff like that a little bit. Another one of our programs is called pro maintenance. It's a program that I helped develop. Uh, we teach it here in Springfield every Tuesday and Thursday. What this is, is it's a hands-on maintenance training class, right? So you come in here, never driven a truck before, you probably don't know how to work on trucks, right? You're not too familiar with the mechanics of a trailer or these reefer units, or maybe even your flatbed trailer. So by all means, we would encourage you to come in, sit down in our class, we go through a, like a PowerPoint presentation, talk about some of the um, 
cost efficiencies of doing these repairs yourself versus sitting and waiting on a road service, um, especially with you know the way our hours work now, time is very, very limited. So being able to do those repairs yourself and get moving versus losing all that revenue, it can be huge and really make or break you know long term for you. So by all means, reach out to your fleet manager if you're interested in doing some of these classes. After we do the PowerPoint, we actually have modules. We go up and show you how to use the tools on the certain parts of the trailer and stuff like that. So really good class. It doesn't cost you anything. It's here in Springfield every Tuesday and Thursday, 8 a.m. over at the Plaza building. So to sign up for that, reach out to your maintenance advisor uh, or your fleet manager. We can definitely do that. Another thing I want to talk about is um, you guys have might have seen it online, but we're getting a little bit of Thermal King reefer units. OK, those will be coming online here shortly. We got a hundred of those coming in. We're going to do a little trial here and see how those work out. So if you're interested in those, hop on our social media. We've got some video links posted up. We shot a lot of videos uh, helping you guys prepare to see these things and know how to control them whenever you do get into those trailers. Uh, so if you have any questions on those, I'd definitely like to answer them. We do have a question and the, that video is not out there oh, yet. Not yet. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming soon on the Thermo Kings. Um, Donald Butter said, could you please mention to the people to please clean out the drain holes on the units? They get stopped up and need to be cleaned. Okay. Yeah. So on the trailers, the reefer units he's uh, referring to, there's going to be six drain tubes. Two of those drain tubes are at the front coming out of the reefer, and that is for the condenser drain tubes. We want to make sure those are nice and clean to allow the reefer condenser to drain out. Uh, moisture in there can cause issues whenever it comes to refrigeration. So making sure those are cleaned out. It's a little rubber piece. You just squeeze them, the water and any sort of debris that may have been in there will flush out. And then also there's two underneath the trailer at the front and then two at the back. And what this is for is whenever, you know, we wash out trailers and product needs to drain out through the floors of the trailer. So some shippers require them to be plugged. So we want to make sure whenever we're doing our pre-trip inspection, we're checking those tubes to make sure they're not plugged if your load doesn't require it and we get any sort of debris and stuff out of those. Uh, Robert Moses said, why do warranty reimbursements take so long to be paid back to the operator? Been so, waiting since April. Oh, okay. Um, oh. So those can take a while. Um, I, I don't work in the warranty department, but I know how it works pretty well. So what happens, so if you have a warranty reimbursement you're looking forward to, basically what happens is the parts need to be returned back to Springfield within a time frame of 60 days, I believe. And then from there, we turn it in and then we have to submit it back to the manufacturer. Once the manufacturer gets that part, then they deem it warrantable, then they send us a credit, and then we process it back to uh, your settlements. Where that becomes a hangup is with, like everybody has a shortage of people right now. So we're seeing a little bit of extended delays on getting those reimbursements back. However, we are working on those in case-by-case -case scenarios. We can help you out with some of that. If it's a larger thing, by all means, just talk to your road assist person, talk to your fleet managers and payrolls, and we can you know do what we can to make sure those credits are on track and they've been submitted so we can get that reimbursement money back to you. Um, yeah. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I asked a lot of questions. That, absolutely, that's what we're here for. Um, is there any way we can get feedback? Like when we drop a trailer that needs to be repaired, can I, as the driver, get feedback and say, hey, that repair was done or it was taken care Just of? Just like a follow up, like, yeah, we, we got somebody out there for that. Exactly. You know, right now there's not really a process in place to, to follow up with that. That'd just be something, you know, communication with your road assist advisor. Um, you know, hey, that trailer, I'll let you know about what ended up happening with it. Um, as far as a, implementing a process to update you on those, I mean, I can Justin uh, from Road Assist as well, and maybe with the IT folks to see if there's a way that, like the work pending notices you get whenever things have been repaired, maybe getting those followed up on trailers that you were attached to. So um, I could getting, you know, a lot of people may not want those alerts coming back in for trailers they don't even have anymore. So I, that'd be something, you know, I could see some people wanting that definitely. And then other people like, oh my gosh, my Qualcomm's getting 500 emails a day. Why am I getting trailers I don't even have anymore? But definitely something we can look into or, or definitely just reach out to your road assist person and communicate with them. So yeah, question. Right there behind you, Bill. Thank you. Um, I try to do as much like repairs on the trailer as I can on the road, like yep. the mud flaps, the sliders for the tandems. Yep. Is there a way for us to get like a kit together so I, we can keep it on the truck? To, like, yeah, so any of our parts room, you're more than welcome to get those back. Um, there are parts and things like that. The bolt kits and stuff we have in the shop, by all means, help yourself to those. If you're going to use them, let's do them. Cool. Another thing I want to touch on with that too, though, if you're doing these repairs to your trailers, guys, make sure you're letting your road assist advisor know. We would much rather pay you $45 for doing a mud flap than paying $300 to get somebody to come out and do it, right? So this is one of the big incentives of our pro maintenance program, right? So it's not your trailer, right? It's Robert's trailer, it's Prime's trailer, we're taking care of the bills. However, that doesn't mean it's not costing you money, right? You go to pick up a trailer and it's not ready to roll and you gotta go to a shop and get a mud flap put on it. 
wouldn't you much rather just go ahead and take five minutes, put that mud flap on, make 25 bucks and start rolling down the road towards your delivery, right? So that's incentive for you. That's money in your pocket. That's time in your pocket. It's also saving prime money. So it's a huge win for everybody. Um, so if you're doing those repairs, like I said, make sure you're sending before and after pictures to Road Assist. I always like to have my drivers let me know before they start initiating those repairs, making sure it's something that we can do or that we can pay you back for. So the big thing on this, just like to your communication, right? I encourage my drivers, you know, get to know me. Let's reach out, know your road assist, just like you would your fleet manager, right? The last place you want to be is on the side of the road, broken down, don't know who to talk to, how to get a hold of them, things of that nature. So by all means, reach out, get to know your people, have that communication and that bond so we can help you out and know when they're here and things of that nature. Um, I'm sorry, Tyler. One yeah. more. Um, why do we get working pending notices for trailers after we drop them instead of when we pick them up? Uh, you should also get them whenever you pick them up. And if they're, you're not getting them when you're picking it up, I don't think you there is a work pending on it. So basically what those work pending notices are, let's say you do drop a trailer and it needs brakes, right? Um, you go to pick it up, that work pending. So the ticket hasn't been closed out for those brakes. So you're getting that work pending notice, right? Saying that this trailer did just get whatever those repairs were done. So you can go through and say, okay, just got brakes. Yep, brakes look good, they're new, I'm good to roll, right? So the work pending notices are just to let you know that work has been done on that trailer recently. Last thing I wanna talk about real quick, guys, we're getting into the warm, warm summer months. That is the time where we start to see an increase in tires and reefer issues. By all means, pre-trips are our key to making sure we eliminate these and get ahead of the issues before they start arising. So pre-trips on a reefer trailer, we've got videos on them. If you guys are interested in how to do it, you can do it before, during, and after. It's just a simple self-test on the micro, the reefer. Go into the menu, press pre-trip. It's going to do a little short self-test. I always encourage people when they're doing their daily pre-trip, start with that pre-trip on the reefer, then start your walk around with the truck and the equipment, and we can go from there. Guys, that's all I have. Thank you for listening to me. Any more questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. You know, I think Tyler made a great point, getting to know your road assist advice to know your payroll advisor, getting to know your log advisor, all of those folks together along with your fleet manager and all of us are really here for the sole purpose to make sure you're successful out there. If you're successful, all of us here in the office will be successful. I wanna bring up our three, I got three out of our four divisions here. We run a reefer division, flatbed tanker and intermodal. Uh, I asked them to come and just talk for a minute about their, their business, what, what it looks like right now, what it's gonna look like after July 4th and you know, just what's going on with customers. So Brian, you wanna start? So I'm gonna ask Brian Brown to come up. Brian's our sales manager in the flatbed division. Been here a long time. I've seen him in action with our customers and he's amazing. So go ahead, Brian. Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, really excited to be here this morning. Um, as Steve mentioned, I've been here about 23 years. I think this is probably the, the best market we've seen since I've been here and probably ever. So it's it's been an exciting time. Uh, what I'm most excited about is not the fact that our rates are going up or that we're making improvements to our contracts, which we're working you know, really hard at every day. What I'm excited the most about in flatbed is uh, you know, going forward when, we, when that cycle comes back down, you know, we're really well positioned. We've added a lot of new customers, a lot of new freight uh, in all areas of the country. So I'm really excited about that, just having more options uh, for you guys out there um, when that market does come back down. So with that being said, um, we're working really hard to improve our tarp fees for you guys. Um, a lot of our other, you know, additional charges out there, stop charges, tolls, uh, detention, um, a lot of stuff like that. We're really pushing hard on our customers to give us what we think is a, a more fair contract. And now is the time to do that. Um, you know, a lot of carriers out there operate on contracts that really favor the shippers heavily. And uh, we feel like, you know, with our partnerships, we need to have a contract that, you know, is, is fair. Uh, fair for you guys, fair for Prime. You know, we pay you guys every Friday. Robert pays us all every Friday. Um, so we want to make sure that our customers are paying us quickly, paying us accurately, um, paying you guys for your time out there, paying for, your, you know, your detention if you're held up somewhere. Um, held up, make sure that you get with your fleet manager and, and let them know, uh, document it. We want to make sure and get you guys paid for it. Uh, your time is valuable and, and nobody understands that better than, than Prime. So, uh, you know, the other thing I would say, uh, it is hot out there. You flatbedders out there tarping, 
securing, you know, working hard. Um, you've seen the temperatures in the in the northwest, up in the northeast. Um, it's pretty crazy out there right now. But make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Um, stay hydrated. Take breaks when you can. Uh, if you start feeling you know, lightheaded or whatever, um, that load can wait, you know, go, go cool off, um, drink some water, sit in your cab for a little bit, sit in the AC, finish that job later. Or maybe if there's another you know, prime driver there or someone else that can help you, um, that, that's a good idea. It's kind of teamwork if you can, but take care of yourself. Um, safety first, when you're tarping those really tall loads, don't put yourself in harm's way. Really encourage you guys to wear your hard hats up there. If you do fall, um, you know, we don't want you getting hurt. We learn to know all of you guys individually as people, not as numbers. And there's nothing worse than getting that phone call saying, Dave got hurt. Dave's a real guy that I know that did get hurt. And we don't want that phone call. We know you guys, we care about you. We don't want you to get hurt. So wear your PPE equipment, wear your hard hats, you know, take care of yourselves and be safe. Um, we appreciate what you do out there. This is not an easy job uh, in the summertime, especially. But any questions for me on flatbed? You got off easy, that's, Brian. That's easy. That's, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you. Now, I think I'll have John Harden come up, uh, our intermodal division. I think it offers some real unique opportunities that are different than what uh, we can offer in reefer and, and flatbed and tanker. So I'm going to ask John to talk about some of the opportunities. John was in our reefer division for a long, long time. Is an intermodal now. So go ahead, John. All right. Thank you, Steve. So I'm with our intermodal division. Uh, we're going through a lot of exciting changes right now. Uh, some of you have probably seen our trailers or even pulled some of our trailers. Uh, that say intermodal with the intermodal logo on the side of them. We're currently in the process of, of selling those off for the most part. Uh, we've pulled all but nine or 10 of them out of the over the road fleet at this point in time. So as we sell those off, we're replacing them with containers. Uh, the railroads are going to containers. They can move twice the equipment on the rail as they could with our trailers. So um, one thing about these, I know that some of you may have hauled some of our trailers in the past, but we want to highly encourage you or discourage you not to hook to our new containers uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they're even heavier than our other trailers that we had. Uh, our trailers were about 1,200 pounds heavier than an over-the-road reefer trailer, uh, just due to some steel cross members, 75-gallon fuel tanks, uh, a few other odds and ends on them that add weight. Uh, these containers are going to be heavier than those. And there's also, uh, since they're on a chassis, uh, we do not have good clearance with a full-size truck or a lightweight truck even, unless we do a few modifications here before we send it out to hook to those containers. So if somebody accidentally hooks to one, they could um, rip off mud flaps, even damage the truck frame. Uh, for sure, probably gonna be overweight with them. So so we just discourage you, if you, if you see a container, you see intermodal on the side of a, a, a trailer container, you know, get with your fleet manager to make sure that that's something that they really want you to pick up before you do so. So to tag onto that, uh, with the heavier equipment we're going to, um, pretty exciting. We're, we're switching out our current fleet from lightweight trucks into day cabs. So we've got about 20 out there right now, uh, 2021 20, out there right now. Um, we're going to be transitioning the rest of our fleet over, you know, here as, as soon as we can, you know, really as soon as it's feasibly possible. So. You know, with that, some exciting things that our drivers are excited about. Obviously, you know, in a day cab, there's no uh, sleeper berth. So they will be at home every night. Um, or if they get stuck out there on the road, which has happened already due to a delay at a customer, you know, they're in a hotel. So uh, they won't be sleeping in their trucks, um, which is pretty appealing for them. And just as Brian had mentioned, the same with intermodal, we're going through um, a really robust freight market. So we've added a lot of freight, a lot of new customers. Uh, we've grown, you know, pretty much in every area that we operate in. So we're looking for, we're looking to add drivers in, in basically all of our markets right now. So uh, Chicago, Southern California, the Fontana area, those are our two biggest markets. Uh, the ones that we stand to grow the most in, uh, we've got, you know, some opportunities up in the PNW in Portland, Seattle, um, Memphis area, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, 
pretty much, you know, with the exception, we're, we're pretty good right now in Kansas City. But other than that, we're, we're looking to bring on drivers. Hey, Fort John. Worth is another one. Uh, we yes. have a question from Angel. What is the pay scale for Intermodal and where can I find out about the pay? Okay. They can contact me directly. It's a different... You can talk to the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'll... they can contact me directly. Um, and Andrea can get my contact information out. Um, but, it, you know, it's obviously a different company and lease. Um, varies by region. So, you know, our drivers do well. Um, the drivers we've had have typically been with us for a long time. Um, but I can definitely go through that um, if you can get me your contact information. Sure. And another question is, can you be a lease driver in the intermodal division? You can in specific markets. Um, you know, two of the markets that we've gone away from lease drivers is, is California and Chicago. So we're company driver only in those two markets. Um, pretty much every other market that we run in, uh, we've got a lease driver, um, probably a lease and company driver in all the other markets. So it, so it does work. Does anybody in here have any questions for me about intermodal? Sounds like a good a lot a lot of good opportunities there, John. You know, think think about those. You know, the day cab, getting home every night. It may, might not be right for you now, but maybe sometime in the future, someone that you know. Uh, you know, we're always looking for referrals. Jim Guthrie. Jim is the head of our reefer division, our biggest division. Uh, Jim has got a huge responsibility up there. So let's find out what's going on in the reefer division, Jim. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see all the new folks here. Uh, you made a good choice coming to Prime, and we're, we're very happy to have you. Uh, you're part of the family now. We're going to work really hard for you, uh, you know, and we're glad to have you here going through the training program. It's great to see a bunch of people in here this morning. Um, you know, the reefer division, Chris talked a little bit about the team earnings, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, highlight what those were the last couple of weeks. So after all expenses paid, the lead seat team average uh, settlement uh, the last two weeks has been $3,700 and $3,400. So uh, that's, a, that's a good good earnings level. We're really proud of that. We want to make it more, and we're going to continue to make it more. But I wanted to highlight the potential there, uh, it, you know, that's available for teams in the refrigerated uh, division. And, and uh, talking about the reefer market right now, it's, it's very hot. Um, well, it's hot outside, and, and business is hot. The market's hot. So, um, you know, there's a lot of demand. We're going into the July 4th holiday here. Uh, and uh, coming out of that, there's going to be a lot of demand for inventory replenishment. And, uh, you know, we see the next several months as, as, as continuing with this very strong demand. So it's a great time to drive for prime. If you've got uh, friends, you've got uh, relatives that, that need, need something to do, this is a great opportunity. Uh, this market looks like it's going to be here for a long time. And, uh, you know, the more growth that we get, you know, Sam Messick did a great job uh, going through, it does a great job with this fuel, uh, fuel buying and, and, you know, really illustrated the power of, of size whenever you're buying. So the buying power that we gain from from our size is substantial, and and it's the same as as on the selling side, the the selling power we have from our size capacity to leverage uh, leverage customers for rates and capacity commitments is is a really important. And so the more we grow, the more that selling power we have. So uh, you, you know it's a great time. Um, we're going into the July 4th holiday. There's probably going to be a lot of people out driving. You know, please, safety is the safety's most important. Please be safe. It's also uh, also very hot in areas around the country. Uh, you know, watch those temperatures. Make sure we've got, uh, we're, we're keeping our trailers and our, uh, our tractors secure. Make sure we're watching those temperatures, fuel levels. Uh, you know, it doesn't take very long to get some of this perishable freight in a, in a real big problem uh, with, with, uh, with the temperatures outside right now. So uh, really appreciate all of you that are out working over the holiday, uh, supporting our customers. They definitely need it. Uh, they're asking for more every day. 
Uh, so we appreciate that. And uh, those of you that are that are going home, uh, you know, we appreciate you as well. And and hopefully we can we can get back out early on Tuesday and get running again because, like I said, the inventory replenishment requests are going to be substantial. So um, you know, and and then we've got a couple more months here in December until we get into the fall, which is the peak season, and and you know we expect to be extremely busy. So uh, you know, all I have uh, that's all I have this morning. So thank you for all you do. Everybody be safe, and I want to wish everybody a, a very happy uh, July 4th holiday. And if anybody has a question for me, oh, we got one. <laughs> Two questions. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I ran into an issue with the reefer. It was 120 degrees outside, and the reefer couldn't keep up. I was running tight on the load. Would I have gotten a service failure if I decided to jump through a trailer wash just to cool off the outside of the trailer to help it keep up? Absolutely not. We would we would uh, just you would communicate with your fleet manager, let them know what's going on. Obviously, probably your road assist person too, trying to you know make sure we we protect that freight. But but there isn't any customer that's going to say, oh well, well I'd rather lose the load than, than you know reschedule or or get a, a you know deliver later. So absolutely not. And is there any way that nighttime dispatch can have access to information like layover and detention bay? Because whenever I call, they say they don't have access to that information. Well, we uh, certainly look at any individual situation, if it's a customer pay or if it's some, some other issue that would be a prime issue. Uh, you know, we, we really want you to talk to your fleet manager about those things because they have, you know, they have that information and that experience there. But, um, you know, de depending on the situation, they may or may not know what uh, what's going on at the time. So I, I would I would encourage you to talk to your fleet manager about those things. Um, you know, the night the night staff is dealing with a lot more uh, a lot more trucks per person, uh, and they also don't have all the information always that they can readily access. Sometimes we're waiting on on information back from customers too, which is generally going to be during the day. So uh, you know, it just really depends on the situation. We do have a question. Um, Mike Vega said, "What can we expect freight wise on July 4th? Um, you know, it is a holiday uh, Sunday, so there's a lot of facilities shut down. But right now, it looks like we've, uh, through most areas of the country, have have a lot of freight loaded on spot trailers. Uh, you know, there will be some variability in in uh, different regions of the country, but uh, we don't we're not going to have any problem keeping folks moving uh, over the weekend, even if we have to reposition a little bit to, to head towards where some of these spot trailers will be preloaded." Hey, Jim, we got a question. You know, we, Salt Lake. We, uh, sorry. So, question? question? Question here in Salt Lake. Oh. Uh, yeah, I've okay. waited, uh, this, this past week, I've waited a significant amount of time at two different locations for an empty trailer after a drop. My fleet manager tells me there's a nationwide trailer shortage. Is anything being done to address this? Um, you know, well, well, first of all, uh, you know, make sure you let your fleet manager know to talk to, uh, uh, to you know, bring, bring, let me let me look at that situation. So have him send that to me so we can take a look at it. We do have a uh, few facilities where our, our customers are behind. Uh, there's some labor shortages. There's some, uh, you know, other problems going on with, I mean, particularly with labor is really the main problem. So, uh, you know, we are, and, and, and in addition to that labor shortage of loading and unloading the trailers that we do have, we also have a situation with, uh, you know, the, the manufacturers getting new equipment. Um, part of part of what we do here is is we really try to keep uh, late model equipment, whether it be trailers or trucks, and so that that keeps the maintenance costs low, uh, that keeps them running, and um, and keeps the ownership costs low. So uh, we're having problems getting new equipment, yes, uh, and and so it does look like we're going to have have to modulate on how much we sell over the next few months uh, until we can get more new equipment. Uh, right now, we do have enough trailers, but we do have some facilities that we're, ha we're struggling with, and we are billing them for those delays, and we need to make sure we take care of you for any delays as it relates to those trailers. I, I think we're going to have, um, you know, once we get into the fall, it may, be, may get a little bit tighter, but then um, by the uh, first quarter of next year, we should be able to have a little bit of relief uh, on, on some new equipment on the trailer front. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so in the past week, my team and I have dropped off uh, six loads early, and we've lost six load locks on those by dropping them at yards or um, other places. When I asked for reimbursement, I was told that Prime is not in the business of reimbursing my load locks. That's $210. What exactly is the policy when I'm dropping it at a yard, a yard yard, or a drop yard, then I put low locks in the back. How do I get that back? Why don't we, why don't we look at it after, uh, after the meeting and let's look and see where those specific situations occurred. Whenever you're dropping an inbound load, what, what uh, the standard practice is generally to get the load locks out. Uh, there are a few facilities that we have problems with them letting us do that. In those situations, we should be crediting you back. So uh, after the meeting, let me let me you know let's let's take a look at it. Other questions? Okay. Again, everybody have a good weekend. Be safe out there. Appreciate all you do. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you coming up. One thing that we cannot neglect to do, and that is if you served in the armed forces, would you go ahead and stand so we could recognize you this morning, please, for your service to our country? You know, Jim talked about the weekend. The last thing I'll say up here, yeah, we are coming into a weekend. There's going to be a lot of four-wheelers out there. If you're wor working, if you're driving, please be careful. Watch your speed. Watch your following distance. Don't be distracted in the cab, and we'll come through this weekend together. As it turns out, we still don't have time for Paul Higgins to come up, but we do have time for Steve Wetke, our vice president of sales and marketing, to close out the meeting. Right before Steve gets up here, housekeeping note, any PSD students, please right after the meeting, report right over here in this left area. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, my name is Steve Wetke. I'm in sales, but uh, uh, really you all are in sales too. Um, you know, I, I've been here nearly 39 years and have, haven't delivered one on time yet, but you all do it every day and we really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to welcome you new folks as well. We think you made a really good decision. Um, you know, we're every day trying to get a little bit better. We're uh, certainly not perfect and we recognize that. And some of the questions you're bringing forth would, would tell us we've still got a lot of work to do for sure. Uh, you've met some of our people, uh, Tyler over here with the Road Assist folks and Chris Martin, a fleet manager that's been here for 18 or 19 years, taking on a new responsibility. I just want you to understand we've got really good people and that is the key to our success. It's always about people. And, uh, you know, Robert, our El Jefe, our boss man, he's laid out today. He's uh, had a little bit of surgery and I think he's trying to take some pain pills to get past it. Um, but uh, he'll, he'll be fine. But if he were here, he would say, we owe you a, a couple of things. Number one, we owe you respect and, and we should all uh, understand that throughout our organization that that our driver base is what has gotten us here and uh, second of all you should be able to make a really good living here and and that's our goal and as everybody has said in every division business is really good uh, it's over the top good and uh, it's a great time to be in trucking y'all should be making a lot of bank right now we hope so uh, if not we should be talking to you about something that's not quite right so uh, we've got fleet managers that are aligned with you. They're your business partners. They want you to be successful as well. You know, our safety department is the best in the country. Uh, Bill and, and Steve and David White and uh, Dennis Davis, what a crew they've got. And they've got a great staff. They want to keep you safe. They want things done right. And that's the way we want to do it here at Prime. So um, look, we really do appreciate what you do. And uh, if you don't take anything else out of this meeting, our safety is our highest calling. You just got to be safe out there. You all that are starting this as a profession, you got to understand this is a very, very challenging and dangerous job. You can get hurt and you can hurt somebody else. So uh, when you get ready to drive, you be on your A game or you don't drive, right? And we don't expect you to do something that's not safe. If you get tired, you need to take a break. Just let your fleet manager know, get secure and uh, catch up on your rest. That's our obligation. So um, it is the 4th, 4th of July coming. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of temperatures. It's going to be high out there. So all of you that are out there hauling freight for us, we thank you for that. We want you to protect your load. We want you to protect yourself. Uh, if we can get through the holiday without a bad guy stealing a load from us or you know, 
get through it without thawing a load down, that'd be good. Those claims uh, are expensive. We need you to protect yourselves and, and the business for our customer base as well. You know, here at Prime, we also have our vendors. Uh, unfortunately, we never have enough time to introduce them all, but they're all over here talking. Uh, they'll be happy to talk to you about their product, uh, anything that has to do with uh, the uh, operational side of their product, they'll be happy to, to talk with you about it. So uh, thank you again. Uh, really appreciate all you do. We're glad you've joined us. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody out there running through the holidays. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about your, your largest variable cost out there being fuel. And if you're watching it, it's, it's going up. So I uh, want you all to understand we, we have a really good um, fuel surcharge mechanism with our customers. And if you'll just do your part of it, uh, you know, getting good fuel mileage, that'll work very well for you. You'll be insulated to the cost of fuel to a large extent. So uh, please uh, thank you all very much. Please be safe. Have a good 4th of July, and we'll be looking forward to talking to you. I doubt if I could got any questions. But if I do, they can call me, 417-343-9449, okay? We appreciate you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. Probably. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I needed everybody besides his mic. I'm stuck. I'm okay. not sure. Okay. It was either something wrestling or microwave. Look at this. No problem.